I decided I'd kill myself the following week. This brought a fresh wave of enthusiasm. After all, the shame of my failures would cease to torture me once the deed was done. My father, as he descended into penury and certain madness, would never again have to lay eyes on his profitless progeny. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. But first I thought I'd have one goodbye drink with the old theater gang. It'd been so long and I missed them so much. I started with my old friend George. <sighs> Last week at the end of our session, you mentioned something about becoming a pagan. You never speak much about spirituality, but you seem generally enthused about discussing it. I wasn't enthused. Please don't say that. Never use that word. Why is that? I work hard to remain decidedly unenthused about anything, because if I become enthused about something, optimistic, desirous, interested, loving, she may take action, and so please don't tip her off. Does she you mention? Lady Fortune. Fortuna. Tyche in the Greek mythology, Benton in Shinto. As we have discussed, because I could not make a living as an actor, I returned to school and have become, although I'm barely hanging on to the position, an adjunct lecturer in the humanities at City University. After becoming a bona fide classicist, I have at times stumbled upon very useful perspectives. The Roman Stoics, for instance, like Seneca, or the Christian Platonists is in Boethius's Consolation, the Greek Sophists, Pythagoras. I speak of ancient wisdom. Anyway, I've come to see that all my life I had been under the false impression that whatever I desired or pursued and how I did so would be consequential, or, or better put, would in some way, in some measure, determine my experience. If one chooses goodness and love, one will have goodness and love. That's what I believed. But now I see that it is all fortune. It is all Lady Luck. And she hates my guts, boy. In a pagan view of the universe, take the Romans, man's experience is determined by fortune's wheel. She spins it at however many and whatever intervals she feels like. Where it lands, that's where you'll stay. Until she spins it, if she spins it again. You may have sat on Easy Street a while, success, health, fellowship, joy, but then, spin. Another concept is, and one that I prefer personally, is that Lady Fortune pays a bit more personal attention to us, to what we do, to our attitudes about life. And if we get it wrong, if we're wrong about how the world works, if we in fact love the world, love anything about it, a person, for instance, or acting in plays, if we love a thing, if we are enthused, as you say, Lady Fortune will teach us her great lesson and put her foot upon our necks. And this is my explanation for what has happened to me. Can you really believe that? Why shouldn't I? Ten years of constant bad luck? Failure, insult, humiliation, injury, tragedy, you name it, it's happened to me. Or to those unlucky enough to be involved with me. It's too consistent to be denied. I have offended her by loving in her world. And man must never do that. Of course, this is evidenced in things large and small. Today I may be strolling along a sidewalk, trying only to focus on walking, but I may notice a pretty cloud, or the colors in the sky, or hear music in the distance, a singer practicing in her apartment, perhaps, and I may feel just a faint pulse of pleasure. Something then must happen, something punitive to remind me, to smack me back in line. That cloud, that colorful sky, that moment of distant music, these are hers, not mine. I'll decide to pay my bills online and cancel the paper invoices. Go green. 
For a moment, I feel like a good citizen. I budget all semester, and by summer, I behold my zero credit card balance, and I feel, for a moment, practical satisfaction. If nothing else, I am an environmentally solvent man. There is pleasure. I am enthused. But then... Days later, the bank will call me and say that my account number has been pirated expertly by a Nigerian hacker and that I have lost $900 plus overdraft fees. An exotic bird loose in the skies of Manhattan will light upon some perch just in time to shit on my shoulder, not after I had my class observed by the chairperson of the department, but directly before. Yes, in the decade that I will be a hostage to fortune, I will be made to know it and know it well. I will, for instance, wear new sneakers and step in artfully camouflaged dog shit. I will wear new slacks and sit in a freshly painted, still wet, permanent lead-based paint. A neighbor moves in above my apartment and he floods the tub, creating a leak which destroys the top two rows of my bookshelf where all my albums and scrapbooks sat. My cell phone will bounce four ways which defy the laws of gravity and physics until it ends in a urinal. The gym I join as a New Year's resolution closes a week later, refunds nobody. I will miss the bus by five seconds and have to walk in a sudden and unpredicted rain without an umbrella. My parents in their old age will divorce and spend all they ever saved on suing each other, then die four days apart in the throes of dementia. I had fun once. I was an actor had a theater company with my dear friends in the 1990s. I loved those days. I kept scrapbooks and albums, treasures to me. But I'll lose my already water-damaged albums and scrapbooks in an apartment fire I didn't cause. Yes. And the worst of them all, one day I'll come down with a sudden 48-hour flu, some strain never seen beyond the city limits of Bombay, on the day I was to attend the funeral of a friend of the first woman I've met in years who found me attractive and charming. We'll have six dates, make love once, then she'll ask me to be beside her in this trying time, to console her in her grief. And I will not be there. And at that funeral, she would meet a new and better man with good fortune. And finally, I will be looking forward one day, today in fact, to a session with my therapist. I want to tell him that I received an email from an old friend, a friend I haven't seen since before this decade of bad fortune began. I want to tell my therapist that his email gave me an idea I had not yet had, one that will appease the all-powerful goddess and free me. I wanted to read you his email, which I had printed out. But when I took the $20 out of the ATM on the way here for your copay, on this still, docile, idyllic September morning, a whirling northeast wind rose and blew that bill up and out of my ever-careful hand. And so even this session, which I meant to enjoy, has been unenjoyable. Our time is up. Forget about the copay. See you next Tuesday. George, it occurred to me just now how long it's been since we've communicated. I was thinking about our old theater company and how much I miss doing plays with you and Jack and the rest of the gang. I haven't done much theater since those days and actually I've amounted to a pretty dismal failure. I've decided to kill myself next Sunday. No more suffering, no more rejection, no more living this absurd and pointless pipe dream. I've decided that not to be is the best answer to Hamlet's question. Oh, I'll be there, old friend. And I'll be by your side all the way. You're right, it is the answer. And so until next Sunday, lady, I will defy you and be enthused. (laughs) I wonder how we'll do it. (laughs) Pills? Ropes. Old-fashioned hanging. Jumping. My, my. Pills, I hope.
<laughs> oh, you know, I gotta believe this, son. Something amazing has just come up. What? Something good, maybe. And it involves you, maybe. Me? Look, come talk to him. He wants to. Your dad here tells me you know something about plays. Well, I've written some plays and directed, and I'm an actor, too. All of it, none of it. Broadway? Yeah, well, we may have something serious to discuss.